I'm talking about stories that Jesus shared. I said Jesus. Stories that Jesus shared. Um, and one of these stories talks about someone who really wanted something, someone who's persistent. They, they really had a desire to attain something. And, and I kind of shared it and related it to my own life. Maybe there's something that you really wanted in your life. Maybe it was some toys, some action figure. Maybe it was a, what are those easy bake ovens. Those things were pretty cool. Maybe it's for, what's like the new like toy out right now? Is there any like new toys out that everyone wants? Kandabos. What are the Kandubis? Kandabos? What are they called? Kandama? Kandama. That's what they call that. Kandamas. Those I seen those are big. Like everyone wants those. Are, oh yeah, look at hold up your kandamas. You got your kandamas? He's got them. I thought they were kandubis. Kandamas. Kobe's. Those Kobe's? The Kobe's, the new Kobe's. <laughs> but anyways, there's there's I'm sure there's been a point in your life where you really, really, really wanted something. For me, I'm gonna share real quick. I'm gonna share if I get your attention. For me, it was something different. Um, anybody ever watch Ninja Turtles? Yeah, yeah. And I'm talking about I'm talking about the real Ninja Turtles. I'm not talking about that Booyakasha stuff. That Booyakasha, no, no, I'm talking about the Kawabunga. Kawabunga, dudes. They don't say that anymore. In the new Ninja Turtles TV show, they don't say Kawabunga. They say Booyakasha. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my little Ninja Turtle heart, my green heart. <laughs> but you remember them, right? My favorite, I'm not sure, you guys probably, a lot of you guys probably the same favorite I did. My favorite was Michelangelo. Michelangelo, he was the cool one. He's the one that skateboarded. He's the, he's, if you guys don't know, he's the orange one right there, the orange one on the left. That's Michelangelo. He had the nunchucks, nunchaku. I call them nunchaku. If you want to be real, you got to call them nunchaku, but people call them nunchucks, right? So as a kid, the thing I wanted more than anything else was a pair of Michelangelo nunchucks. And I'm not talking about, like, the cheap plastic or rubber ones with, like, the styrofoam at the end so you wouldn't hurt yourself. I wanted the real, legit, like, made out of real solid wood. It glistened in the sun when you shine, when you whoosh, 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 whoosh. Like, I had, I had already known, like, a routine in my head what I would do if I had a real pair of nunchaku. But I never <laughs> got a chance to experience that, right? And I remember just, if I had my own pair, you know, I would, I would fight evil forces. I would beat Shredder and his army. I would just, I would become an honorary Ninja Turtle. It's going to be awesome. When I get those nunchaku, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. So in order to do that, I needed to get it. Obviously, at six, seven years old, I didn't have my own job. Otherwise, that would be child labor, which would be illegal, which I never did. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I had to ask my mom to buy them. I was like, Mom, I really, I really need these. I need, to, I, need to, I need to protect our family. Or if someone breaks into our house, I need to protect our family. You can go, you can go back to Once Upon a Time slide. Don't go to that door yet. Um, <laughs> but I just remember telling my mom, giving her all these excuses, mom, I need these. I absolutely need these. And then she said something to me. She never was straightforward. Like when I wanted something that she didn't want me to have, she would never straight up tell me no. She would say, we'll see. Does ever get that? Mom, can I go, can I go to the movies tonight? We'll see. But, but it's like, it's like in two hours, we'll see. What, can I go or can I not go? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I just remembered hearing that. I'm like, oh, man. I was like, we'll see. Like, if it was in text form, if I asked her through text, Mom, can I do this? We'll see. Dot, dot, dot. Oh, that dot, dot, dot killed me. All right? <laughs> see, she would, <laughs> she would try to protect me because I'm sure if at six years old I had a real pair of nunchaku that were made out of wood and metal, I'm sure I would have probably broken something in myself or broken my sister. And <laughs> that's probably why she kept those things for me. But I just wanted them so badly. Anybody know that feeling? What's up? Is there any, any story? Anyone, anyone have an item that you really wanted growing up? A dog? Oh, maybe it was a dog, a pet parrot, a pet snake, pet rat. Something crazy, right? <laughs> and maybe you've had feelings just like that. Maybe you've, you've done the same thing I did. You asked your mom, you asked your dad, I really need this, I really want this. And they would respond, they'll say, we'll see. Sometimes they'll, say, sometimes they'll actually say, no. Sometimes they'll say, wait. Sometimes they'll say, maybe. Sometimes they'll give you a different response. It might not be the response that you want, but they'll give you a response. All right? And when it was no, when it was wait, when it was maybe, when it was we'll see, we usually were disappointed. We were sad. We were hurt. Man, I just, I just need this in my life. Right? We didn't say, I didn't want it. I needed it. All right? And maybe as you get older, sometimes we start to do the same thing with God. Let's be real. Maybe as we got older, in, uh, entering into middle school, high school, entering into your teens, we do the same thing with God. There was something you wanted. 
Maybe it was something simple. Oh, I just want better skin complexion. Just Neutrogena is not working for me. God, I just pray, God, you clear up my face. Maybe you wanted a better GPA. Maybe you got a 1.9. Dang, but you wanted a 3.0. Maybe there's that test that you're about to take and you wanted an A on that test. Maybe it was a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Dang, we're not dating here, are we? Good, good. Come talk to me if you are. I'm, gonna... I'm just kidding. <laughs> And there's maybe there's things that you've asked for. And just like your parents said, no, wait, maybe, we'll see, dot, dot, dot. Maybe God has told you the same thing. Maybe God's told you, wait. Maybe God has told you, no. Maybe God has told you, not right now. And then when you hear that response, when there's something you've really been wanting, maybe you could be thinking about that thing during this entire message. Be thinking about something that you've really wanted, whether it's something material, whether it's something emotional, something physical, something that you just really wanted in your life, some kind of breakthrough. And maybe God didn't answer the way you wanted to. And so you backed up, like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this is a God that's supposed to say yes. This is a God that's supposed to come through. And because he said no, maybe you backed off in that moment. Maybe you backed off from God completely. Maybe you're sitting in this room right now and you're here because your parents told you to come, because your grandma or grandpa told you to come. But you're still like, God's told me no too many times. God has said maybe. God has said we'll see too many times. Regardless of where you're at, I'm sure you've all sent out at least some kind of prayer before, right? Some kind of, maybe at the free throw line, God, I pray you make this shot. If you're Curry, you'll probably make it. Mm. If you're not Curry, if you're Apollo, you'll probably miss it. <laughs> maybe you're on a plane and all of a sudden there's a little bit of turbulence. Oh, Father, please don't let this plane go down, Lord. I'm so young. I still got so much to live, right? <laughs> Maybe it's right before you take that test that you just prayed about earlier. We've all been there. We have these questions. We have these moments of prayer. We have these moments of asking God for things, right? Um, and we're going to look at a story today, a story that Jesus told. And it's a story about this guy in a similar situation, a guy who wants something, and he's asking some help to get it. All right, and the story's in Luke chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, you can take them out. If you don't, take out your Bible apps. If you don't, we'll pray for you. I'm just kidding. We have some Bibles. If you want some Bibles, we can have some Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, come talk to me, Scott Asen. We'll make sure that you get a Bible sometime before next week or by next week if you don't have one. <clears throat> so if you have Luke 11, open up to Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> when you get there, say amen. Amen. There you go. I want you guys to follow along with me. All right? I don't want you just to... Believe what I say and look at my screens. I want you to also follow along. If you have a Bible or if you have your Bible apps, you can take them out. But Luke chapter 11. And a lot of times what Jesus did is he wouldn't tell people straight up what he wanted to, to talk about. Sometimes he would tell them in stories because they couldn't fully understand. He would have these heavenly concepts or this deep theological idea and it would just go right over their head. And they had no clue what he was talking about. And so he would tell them these stories. And this is one of those stories in Luke chapter 11. And this is 11, verse 5. You can put that scripture up on the screen for those that don't have a Bible with them. You can't read it? You can read that? Is that good? I'll read along with you guys. Okay. And it says, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight. What time? Midnight. So it's late. It's dark. Right? Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit. It's midnight, and I have nothing to give him to eat. And suppose he calls out. So this is you knocking on your friend's door. Everyone say. It sounds cool when large groups of people do that. Right? So you're knocking on the door, and your friend answers back and says, suppose he tells you from his bedroom, don't bother me. Someone say, dang. <laughs> dang. Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night. My family and I are still in bed. We're all in bed. I can't help you. Dang. I, mean, I just got up at midnight. I'm knocking on your door. I'm coming to you. I'm tired, too. I got mocos in my eyes. Oh, man. And I'm coming here knocking on your door, and you're telling me, no, go away. And when you hear this story, you're thinking, man, this guy in the house, he's being rude. How come he's not letting him in? Why is he being so mean? Your friend's here at midnight. He's your boy. You should hook him up, right? And then I started thinking about it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Maybe, maybe I'm the rude one knocking on my friend's house at midnight. What am I doing up at midnight knocking and asking for some bread? Imagine I came to your house at midnight. Say, hey, Marcus, open up. I need some bread. What would you tell me? Like, Go, away. Go away. You're tripping, right? <laughs> so, maybe, so maybe I'm tripping. Maybe I'm the rude one, right? <laughs> but anyways, he goes to the door, knocks, knocks, knocks. says, come on, give me some bread. Someone's here. I need to feed them. So it's locked, right? He says, the door is locked. My family and I are all in bed, and I can't help you. And what's crazy thinking about this time, I was reading up, doing some little bit of studies, and I found out in the houses, like nowadays we have like a living room, we have a kitchen, we have the family room, we have three bedrooms, four bedrooms, I don't know how big your house is, you have the backyard. But back in the day in these houses, a lot of times it would just be a house with just one room. Like, they, like the kitchen would be right next to the bedrooms, would be right next to the living room, like it was all one area. You cooked where you slept. You did your duties where, <laughs> I'm not going to get into detail, right? All in the same spot, all in one living area, all right? And there was a hole in the ground, you did your business, and it was right next to the bedroom, right? Usually they put it on the opposite side of the house. But, so, so when you're knocking on this door, you're not just knocking on my window, like where you wake me up. You're waking up my entire family, all right? So I started thinking, okay, maybe, maybe I'm the rude one here, all right? He says, I can't help you, but I tell you this. Jesus, this is Jesus talking now. Though he won't do it for friendship's sake. He's not going to do it just because he's your boy. He says, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and he will give you whatever you need because of your shameless audacity. Dang, someone say audacity. When I hear that word, I have to say like, oh, you have the audacity. Like, like I have to shake, audacity. Like, I have to shake my cheeks because it's such a powerful word, right? It says, you had the shameless audacity. You're here at midnight. Knock, knock, knock. No answer. Knock, knock, knock. No answer. Knock, knock, knock. He's awake. Knock, knock, knock. Come to the door. He doesn't come up. And he says, the, as, if you stay persistent, if you keep on knocking, that friend will be so irritated that he will eventually get up to stop you from knocking, right? And he'll give you some bread. So it's the craziest story as I think about it as we break it down. See, it's a straightforward scene, right? This man coming at midnight, knocking on this door. And Marcus said, dude, you tripping. You are tripping. I'm not going to answer that door. Right? <laughs> but this is what happens. Here, let me go through. I got a little bit lost real quick. I kind of compare it to, like, like, I'm camping, right? I'm camping late at night, and I'm sitting in my tent, and all of a sudden, like, I, I go over to, I go over to, I don't go, I keep going to Marcus. I'm going to go over to. I'm going to go over to, who, I'm going to go to Kendall's house. I'm going to go to Kendall's tent, right? I'm like, Kendall, Kendall, open up your tent, Kendall. Man, what you want? Dude, I really want Snickers. I know you got Snickers in your bag, right? And he's like, man, you waking me up at midnight for some Snickers? Go to bed, right? But I just keep on, if I keep on tapping on his tent, tap, 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 zip, 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 tap, tap, tap. Give me some Snickers. Eventually, what are you going to do, Kendall, to get me to go away? He said, he said Snickers. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to give him the Snickers, right, so he can leave me alone. <laughs> and that's what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus is saying in that scripture at the end. He says, at the end, where is it? What, can you put that scripture back up? I'm sorry. There you go. And he says, if you keep knocking long enough, he'll get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless audacity. So keep on knocking. And this story, this story, friends, is, is a story of us and God. We are that irritating friend, or at least we need to be that friend who knocks on that door. And we see this person whose, whose house it is, this is God. And this is what Jesus does. He tells these stories to put in our minds what it means to pray, what it means for God to come through, to really come through. So God is this person who's living in this house. We're the person, knock, knock, knocking on that door. There was a time in between, before God answered that door, before this friend answered the door, there was that in between, there was that we'll see period where the friend said no. The friend said, we'll see, dot, dot, dot. He had to wait. He had to keep on knocking, keep on knocking. His friend said, go away, dude. My boo's sleeping. My brother's over here. I got to step over my brother to get to you. Make sure I don't step on my mom's hair. And I got to climb over my donkey. No. All right? But his friend, what did he do? He kept on 
knocking. And that's frustrating, right, to keep on knocking, to be waiting there. It didn't say how long he waited. I'm sure he was out there for a while. He might have been out there for 20, 30. He might have been out there for an hour, just knock, knock, knocking. And it makes us wonder sometimes. We get to that point where we're going to God's door, and we knock, 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 and we're waiting. And we ask God for something, and it doesn't happen. Maybe you ask for your grandma to get better, but she's still not better, and you're sitting there waiting, knocking. Maybe you're, you're praying for that relationship to get better with your mom or your dad, and you knock, 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 and it doesn't get better, and you sit there waiting, dot, dot, dot. And you get frustrated. God, why aren't you coming through right now? God, why aren't you doing something right now? We start to get angry. We get suspicious. And sometimes we even start to doubt. And we're saying, God, why aren't you coming to the door? Why aren't you coming to the door? Why aren't you coming to that door? If you can put the next scripture up. I'm sorry, that same script, the big scripture that I had up. I'm going to keep that up there for you guys to look at in a little bit. But it says in verse 8, that last verse again. Even though he'll not get up and give the bread because of friendship, because of the shameless audacity, he will get up and give you what you need. Hmm. And I have, if you could help me out, bring this whiteboard. Get stuck right there. Ooh, you're good. Thank you. You can help me out. Okay, knock, knock, knock. I have a little illustration for you I want to put up here. See, what happens a lot of times is, I just want to make sure everyone can see this. I'll put it right in the middle. If you can't see, just let me know. Can everyone see the whiteboard? Can everyone see where my hand is? Yeah. You guys can all see that? All right, cool. And what happens a lot of times when we go to God, when we pray, when we're in this dot, dot, dot period, sometimes our mindset, sometimes what we think about God gets messed up because we look at him in, in one of a few ways. I'm going to put up four ways that we might look, that we might view God, and also how we view ourselves. So I'm going to be putting up... God is and I am, okay? So a lot of times we have a view of what God is and we have a view of who we are, who I am, right? And there's four different things. So one of the ways we see God, one of these ways we see God is as a judge. He's almost like a meticulous judge, right? Does anyone know what the word meticulous means? What's that? Many? Yeah, so he does many things. That's right. Lots of people think it's like it's very like there's tiny little things that he looks. A lot of times we see God as this God who just keeps track, who keeps tally, who has a scorecard. Right? We see that, oh, God just wants to make sure that we're doing all the things right. He wants to make sure that we're going to church. He wants to make sure that we're reaching out to others. He wants to make sure that we're doing this. And God does do that. But a lot of times we see God as this meticulous judge, and we see that I am present. You guys ever go to class and they're taking role? What are one of the things people say? Present, they say present, right? I'm here. So a lot of times what we do is we see, we know that God is meticulous judge, so I am going to be there. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be doing those things on that checklist. When that scorecard comes up, when that grade sheet comes out, I want to make sure that I prayed. I want to make sure that I read my Bible. I want to make sure that I talk to my friends about Jesus. I want to make sure that I come to church, right? And we have this check mark, this tally system that we see God is this judge who's Giving us this report card, I want to make sure that all areas of my report card are full when he comes to see me. All right? And God is a judge, and God is a meticulous judge, but this isn't the only trait of God. When we, only treat, when we treat him only as this meticulous judge, something happens. Something happens. We become self-serving. We start doing these things for me. We start doing these things for a report card. We start doing these things for approval. I'm doing these things so I can get into heaven. I'm doing these things so I can get approval from God. When we look at God just as this judge, we become self-serving. That's one of the ways. Maybe you're in that boat. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're like, no, that doesn't really relate to me. 
But I guarantee you, I'm going to talk about four things, and you're probably going to fall into one of these places. And we're going to wrap up after that. Another thing we do is we say that God is a flowing fountain. Everyone say flowing fountain. Flowing fountain. fountain. Excuse my handwriting. I was a kindergarten teacher. Some of my kindergartners wrote better than I did. So we see as God as this flowing fountain, this God, he just wants to give and give and give. He wants to hook us up, right? And so when we see God as meticulous judge, we see I am present. I am here. When we see God as this flowing fountain, we say, I'm blessed. My wife's blessed. My kids are blessed. I'm just blessed, right? Someone say, I'm blessed. All right? So what happens, when we see God as this flowing fountain, we see I'm blessed. Because God is a flowing fountain, I am blessed. So God just always wants to hook it up. And it's almost like, it's almost like a vending machine. Right? Like, okay, okay, God, I put a dollar in, Snickers bar pops out. Boom. And we, see, we view God as this vending machine. Right? I put in something, he blesses me. Right? And if it's broke, if it's not working, maybe i got to put another dollar in. Maybe it'll, then it'll, it'll give me my Snickers bar. Right? We see God as this flowing fountain. Is God a flowing fountain? Yes, he is. He absolutely is. He is a flowing fountain. He wants to bless you. He wants to hook you up, right? But what happens is when we only see him as this flowing fountain, what happens is we become cell fish. Mm, come on. So we go from seeing him as a judge, I'm here present, checking off everything I need to do. I become self-serving. I start doing things for me. When we see God only as this flowing fountain, we say, I'm blessed. We all blessed. I become selfish. I do things because I'll get something in return, because God will give me something, because God wants to hook me up. I am blessed. Maybe you're saying, oh, maybe I don't fall into this category. Maybe I don't see God just as a judge. Maybe I don't see him just as this flowing fountain where I'm always just blessed. Maybe you're somewhere else. Maybe you're seeing that God is this, I'm sorry, God is this, Unattainable, you ready for this? Unattainable standard. You read that? Unattainable standard. We see it. God is just this perfect being. God is just the standard of God. The standard of Jesus is just so unattainable. I can't be like him. There's no way. And when we view him as just this unattainable standard, we say, I am broken. See, God is just perfect. God has reached this level of perfection that I'll never be able to reach. I am broken. I will never be fixed. There's no way I'll be good. There's no way I'll work the way that he wants me to work. We become broken. And sometimes that could be the good place to be. We say, God, I'm broken before you. God, I need your help. But if we stay in that mindset, if we stay in, in God just being this unattainable standard that we can never reach, we can never get to, something happens. We become self-absorbed. We make it about my brokenness. I'm not good enough. I'm not this Christian everyone wants me to be. And I'll never be that way. When we say that, I am broken, I'll never be fixed, we take away power from God. We're saying God can't fix me. We know that God can do all things. Amen? Amen. God can do all things. So when we just see him as this unattainable standard, We say we're too broken to be fixed. We become self-absorbed. We make it about me and my brokenness, not about God and his goodness. And maybe you're saying I'm in that spot. Maybe there's these three things that you feel like you can relate to. And there's one more thing that happens. We see God. I'll double check. We see God as this intimidating ruler. And maybe there's a point in your life where you felt like that. Growing up in my childhood, I saw God as this intimidating ruler. Man, I'm scared. I don't want to go to hell. There's things that, you know, that I've done. You know, there's, there's no way I could even approach him. I'm scared to approach him, right? He's just this intimidating ruler. And we say that I am nothing. We get to this point where we say, I am nothing. 
nothing. The Bible says that God created you in his image. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. When you say, I am nothing, you're saying God's creation. What God created is nothing. Imagine you going to your parents and saying, Mom, Dad, I'm nothing. That's almost like an insult to them. See, I created, I created you. I raised you. And for you to say you are nothing, that breaks my heart. So when we say we are always just nothing, we will never amount to anything. God is this intimidating ruler. What happens is we become selfless. Maybe you're saying, isn't that a good place to be? A good place is to be selfless? Yes, it's not about me. It's all about God. But when we say that we are nothing, that we can't do things, when we can't do things for his kingdom, when we can't accomplish things, we're saying that God can't do those things through me. So is God a judge? Yes. yes he's a good judge, right? Is God a flowing fountain? Yes, he's a flowing fountain. Is he in this unattainable standard? Is he just perfect? Is he, is he perfect in every way? Yes. yes, he is. And is he also this ruler who is capable of bringing life? He's also capable of taking things away. Is he this ruler that we see sometimes? Yes. yes, he is all of these things. But when we make this just the focus, that's where we're wrong. Because God isn't just a judge. God isn't just a fountain. God isn't just perfection. God isn't just a ruler. He's all of them at the same exact time. We have to look at all the attributes, all the traits of God to understand how to approach him. When we pray, to come persistently, we have to know who God is and how to approach him. And the, the disciples, they asked. The disciples asked Jesus. If you can go to that last scripture. The disciples asked Jesus, Luke 11, 1 and 2. They asked him, Jesus, how do we pray then? Jesus, how do we pray it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray just as John taught his disciples. He's saying, Lord, John taught his disciples. Why don't you teach us? Right? And what he says, this is the beginning of that verse. Verse 2, he says, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, our Father. When you pray, say, Father. And when I see this image of a father, I think of someone who I shouldn't be scared of, who's someone who I, I should be able to go to their door and I should be able to go and knock. And I just want to apologize right now. If there's someone in this room, if there's people in this room right now who maybe you don't have the best relationship with your father, I want, you to, I want to tell you right now that our heavenly father He is an amazing daddy. Maybe your dad left you when you were younger. God says he'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Maybe your dad was abusive. Maybe your dad hit you. Maybe he was verbally abusive. Maybe he, he beat you down with his words. Maybe he even used his hands. God will never hurt you. Maybe your dad abandoned you like mine did. But God would never do that. I want to tell you right now that God is a perfect daddy. He is this perfect father who you can come to. I might not want to knock on my friend's door at midnight. But when Jesus says, when you pray, pray, Father. When I pray, you know, the door that I am knocking on is the door of my heavenly father. That's the door of my heavenly father. I should feel comfortable. I should be able to come and knock at his door and not be ashamed. I need to have that shameless audacity. Someone say shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. Because the reality of this story is this, this man that eventually opened the door, because of his friend's persistence, he opened that door. How much more will God do the same? When we come knocking at his door saying, God, I need this breakthrough. God, I need you to bring healing. God, I need you to come through right now in this moment. How much more will God get up 
Just like this man's heart was moved, God's heart can be moved by your persistence. God's heart can be moved by your shameless audacity. God's heart can be moved by you constantly knocking. So when you pray, don't just pray once. When you pray, say, God, I need this to happen, and it doesn't happen, then you walk away. That's not how prayer is designed. That's not how God wants you to be. God wants you to be audacious. God wants you to be shameless. He wants to come to you, you to come to him continually to keep on knocking. There's a verse right before this. If you can put up that verse, you might have heard, heard this verse before. Uh, the, different, the other verse before that. Here it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, what happens? The door will be open. You might have heard this verse, but not in its entire. This verse comes exactly from the story that I just shared. To seek and to find, to knock, and the door will be open. If I can have Ruben come up, I'm going to close out. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. I promise you in your moment of prayer in that dot, dot, dot period that God will answer you. But you have to be willing around, willing to stick around for it. You have to be willing to keep on knocking, to keep on asking. Don't just pray once and walk away. Pray it again. Pray it again. Pray it again. Be persistent. Keep on knocking. God, I'm here. I'm at your door. God, open up. God, I need you in my life. I'm here knocking at your door. Open up. But too many times we knock. And we're scared. Oh, he's this judge. I don't want to, I don't want to offend this judge. I want to make sure that all my ducks are in a row. And so we just peace out. Or too many times we see him as this flowing fountain. We just have this expectation. Maybe you see him as, a, as this intimidating ruler. You don't even want to knock. Like, there's no way God wants to hear from me. Or maybe you see, I'm too broken. There's no way God will listen to me. I'm telling you right now that God is listening. God wants you to come in, but he wants you to knock and keep on knocking. And as you're praying to God, I don't know what his answer is going to be for you. That's between you and God. He might say yes. He might say no. He might say later. But you need to keep on seeking him. I just want to pray right now. Then we just close your eyes and just bow our head. I just want you to think about something right now in your life, something that you want break free, that you want to break free from. An area of your life where you feel like you're chained down, where you feel like you're weak, where you feel like you're tired, and you need some deliverance from. You need some God in your life. I want you to think about something that you've been really desiring and you're too scared to ask because you're scared of this God who's this judge or this God who's a ruler and you're too scared to ask. But right now I say you need to ask him and you will find. You need to knock so that door will be open. And what we're going to do right now, if, if you want to keep on praying, you can come up and pray. If not, in a little bit, you're going to be dismissed to go 
But I just want to pray for all those things. Maybe it's someone who's sick in your family. Maybe it's a fight that you've been having with your parents. Maybe it's a broken relationship you have at school. Maybe it's someone who's hurt you, who's offended you. Whatever it is, I just want to pray right now. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for every single person in this room, God, who is going through something, who's going through some heartbreak, who's going through some pain, who maybe everything is good right now, Father, but they just haven't heard from you in a while. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe they're hurt, Father. But I pray, God, in this moment, God, as we seek out to you, as we knock, Father, that we don't stop knocking, God. We keep on knocking. We keep on seeking after you. We keep on coming after you, Father, because we know, God, that just as that man's heart was turned, that your heart can turn toward us, Father, and you can open up and you can bring freedom in our life. You can bring us breakthrough. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.